It's Monday. It's 2020. And uh, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. My name is David McConaughey. And today I'm joined by Brianne Fallon. Brianne, it's so wonderful to hear you again. You are world gallivanting, are you right now? When when this airs, you will be where? I will be in Jerusalem when this airs. Um, I'm taking oh, a whole month um, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, for work purposes, and it's not somewhere I have been before. And yeah, I'm really finding it an exciting place, and I'm I've been to seven museums so far, so I'm sort of knee deep in it all. And yeah, no, I'm really enjoying it. I'm so jealous. Today you should I'm be. Also, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also jealous that. Um, Ben Marcus, who who interviewed uh, today's guests Maggie Garrett and Jennifer Hawks um, about what they're talking about, which is separating religion and government. But what is religion? A look at the U.S. Supreme Court. So take it away. Hello, and welcome to the Religious Studies Project. I'm here today with Jennifer Hawks and Maggie Garrett to talk about religion and law in the United States. What qualifies as religion, and what merits religious freedom protection? We'll discuss those topics and more by taking a deep dive into the cases before the Supreme Court in the term beginning in October 2019. We're grateful to have two legal experts here with us today to help us understand what religion means in United States courts. Jennifer Hawks is the Associate General Counsel at the BJC. She provides legal analysis on church-state issues that arise before Congress, the courts, and administrative agencies. Before coming to BJC, Hawks was the Director of Advocacy and Outreach Services for the Family Abuse Center in Waco, Texas, where she conducted a legal clinic and led educational programs. She previously worked for two judges in the state of Mississippi and served as a staff attorney for the Mississippi Department of Human Services. Hawks also served in both paid and volunteer ministry positions in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Texas. A graduate of Mississippi College and the University of Mississippi School of Law, Hawks earned a Master of Divinity degree from George W. Truett Theological Seminary at Baylor University. She is a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, Texas, and Mississippi Bars, and she was ordained into the gospel ministry by McLean Baptist Church in McLean, Virginia. Maggie Garrett is the Vice President for Public Policy for Americans United for Separation of Church and State. She represents Americans United before Congress and the Trump administration, and she oversees the state legislative program. For the last eight years, she has served as the co-chair of the National Coalition for Public Education, a coalition of more than 50 national organizations that opposes private school vouchers. She's also the chair of the Coalition Against Religious Discrimination. And before uh, Maggie joined AU's legislative department, she served as the legislative director and staff attorney at the ACLU of Georgia, where she litigated high-profile cases on issues including the separation of church and state, free speech, reproductive rights, and voting rights. She was also a fellow at the ACLU of Alabama, where she participated in litigation to remove Judge Roy Moore's Ten Commandments display from the Alabama Supreme Court. Maggie graduated from Hamilton College and the George Washington Law School. So two fantastic uh, people who can walk us through this Supreme Court term and talk to us about religion in law uh, in the United States. So we'll begin with a question for Jennifer which is really about just a bit of context. So tell us a little bit more about the case before the Supreme Court this term that deals with religious freedom. I know that while the Supreme Court receives thousands of requests to take up cases each year, they only hear about 2% of them. So what is the religious liberty case that they're taking for this term? Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, And while the court has taken one case already. It's important to note that the court could take additional cases um, uh, as the year progresses, that that they take cases um, throughout the year. Uh, But the the case for this next year is Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. And it's a case involving a state tuition tax credit program, which is a type of voucher where um, state money ends up supporting uh, financially uh, religious and non-religious uh, private schools and the um, Montana Supreme Court struck down the program and uh, the parents who uh, brought suit uh, to, to to enforce the program appealed to the Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court took the case and we'll have arguments you know later on in the term. 
Great. And maybe, uh, Maggie, could you tell us a little bit more about school voucher programs and how they've operated in the United States, what their uh, role is in private and public education? Sure. So um, in the United States, we have public schools, and that has been the primary way that we've um, funded schools um, over the years, for many years. But what's happening recently is there is a real push to have private school vouchers, which essentially means that you take taxpayer dollars um, and you funnel them to private schools. And What happens is that it primarily funds religious schools, and the reason why is because religious schools are usually cheaper than secular private schools, and that is often because um, the religious entity that they're associated with will subsidize the education. And so they're cheaper, and then private school vouchers predominantly fund them. And um, at at issue in this case is uh, whether or not you can have a tuition tax credit at all. Can you can you give money to a secular school um, and say no, we're not going to give money to a to a private school that's religious? Um, so that's really what's what's at issue here. And um, for the first time. Um, Someone wants the Supreme Court to say that a state has to fund uh, religious education if they're going to fund secular private schools. And I imagine that one of the first questions by people who do want to support uh, these tax credits going to religious schools is that their understanding is that the U.S. Constitution says that you shouldn't favor one religion over another, you shouldn't favor religion over non-religion, or vice versa. So why isn't a tax credit that goes to a private non-religious school or a, or fun, funding that goes to public school not favoring non-religion over religion or is that a false binary is there is it not so easy to say what is religious and what is not religious uh, so Traditionally in the United States, we have said that um, freedom of religion means that no one is taxed uh, by the government to fund anyone's religion. So I, as a Lutheran, I'm not taxed to pay for Lutheran schools. I'm not pa- paid or I'm not taxed to pay for anybody's religion, whether I agree with it or not. Um, and that has really been um, the standard. And we have been slowly seeing the courts chip away at that. Um, and we've been slowly seeing them say that it's actually okay for you to fund, you know, tax dollars going towards um, religious education. Um, I don't think that it is is discrimination against religion to say that taxpayer dollars are not going towards um, religious activities, religious education, religious learning. Um, in my mind, um, establishing religion is um, is really about funding religious education. That's sort of at the the core of of religion, right? Is teaching your religion. Um, here we are teaching religion to children, um, and that's sort of the rock of of um, of the church is um, you know teaching young children and, and raising them in the church. So it is. Not not, in my mind, discriminate, discrimination against religion. It's the, the government ma- maintaining neutrality and the government saying, we just stay out of it. We don't fund it. Um, you know, they get a lot of um, exemptions and then they also don't get government funding. I would add, as a, as a Baptist minister and, and, and a constitutional lawyer, that um, the government not funding religious schools and religious organizations is what has allowed religion to flourish in our country in a way that is, is unmatched in, 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 in any other country. Um, it's up to us as religious people to fund our, our religious practices and to fund our religious communities and to reach out to our neighbors to ensure that those communities continue. Um, and so because of this, the American church has to be responsive to the community around it. It, it has to find a, it, its place and its role because it's not going to get a check every month for, for, from the government, whether people attend or not. Um, and so, so to, to fundamentally alter the way that our religious communities are funded would be very harmful to the communities themselves. Uh, religious schools uh, have a lot of um, freedom and autonomy that, that are not experienced by public schools or public charter schools or other types of, of, of school systems. And it's precisely because of that autonomy um, that we should want the maximum amount of separation so that religious schools are accountable to the religious communities and not accountable to taxpayers who could care less whether or not that, that religious community uh, f- uh, flourishes or dies. Right. So I'm hearing a lot of arguments that are often put forth for why religious freedom is, is good, not only for government, but also for religious institutions, that the separation of church and state allows for religious communities a great deal of autonomy. It allows them, as the argument often goes, to flourish in the United States. 
and that really at root here, from what I've heard from both of you, is a question of taxpayer funding, that taxpayer funding should not flow to religious institutions. I think that brings up another case that was already argued at the Supreme Court and decided, which is the Trinity Lutheran case, which is being brought up in the arguments for Espinoza. So could you walk us a little bit through the Trinity Lutheran decision and what it meant for uh, religious freedom? In part, I'm very interested in exploring with Trinity Lutheran where the court sort of sees religion ending and some other kinds of programs beginning or deciding whether funding in the funding in that particular case was supporting a religious institution as a religious institution or whether it was really supporting something else. So could you talk a little bit more about that case? Sure. Uh, So in Trinity Lutheran, that issue was um, a state grant and the state grant would help public and private schools um, and other nonprofit organizations purchase rubber playground materials. Um, It was made from recycled tires. And so there's a great grant program and, um, this religious school applies for uh, the grant, and they, like Montana, have a constitutional provision that says that they can't spend money to aid religion. And so the the state of Missouri says, "I'm sorry, you're not eligible for this this um, tire grant, this playground." Grant, um, and so they said, "Well, that's religious discrimination um, that you're funding other secular organizations, but you're not you're not funding us simply because we're religious." Now. I would argue that that's not what was happening. What was happening is that the government was saying, again, you know, you're a religious school and we don't aid you. We don't, um, we don't tax you. And so, you know, there's a separation of church and state. But what the court held was that they were being discriminated against and they were being excluded from the program because of who they are, because they were a religious entity. Um, the court made clear, though, that this was a really narrow decision and that they were talking about, um, playground materials, which wasn't a religious, and it wasn't a religious item, it wasn't a, it wasn't translated into religious activity, um, that this case was, you can't discriminate against them because of who they are. However, the government could still take into consideration how the money would be used. Um, and I think that is really the, the distinction here is, um, they're not not funding religious schools because they are religious schools, but because that money would be used for religious education. And um, religious schools normally um, entwine religion throughout the school day. It's not as though they teach, you know, one subject and then they take a break and then there's religion. Um, it's entwined in what they do. There's Bible studies, there's mandatory religious activities, etc. cetera. Um, and so this would really be a case about funding the religious activities, the religious education. Um, it's not necessarily about who they are. And I think that brings up a question that I heard at least in different sort of moot courts that were leading up to the Trinity Lutheran case, um, which were really people pushing at the question of what is a religious activity? So is maintaining a playground a religious activity? Is, um, you know, buying textbooks for your math class a religious activity? Is buying textbooks for a religious studies class a religious activity? Is maintaining, if there's a, a, a generally available fund of money to uh, keep up historically significant buildings in a community and there's a church that's a historically significant building, can those funds be used to repair the pews in that church? Um, or, and what what generally available activities or services are not available to religious institutions, whether that's the fire department, you know, if there's a fire at the school, those are the kinds of questions that I was hearing. And I think what they're getting at are questions of what is religion qua religion? What is religion really? And what is a secular activity or a secular program or service. So could you talk talk a little bit more about that? How did the court come down on those questions? Did they have an answer for those questions? Or what are your thoughts about those questions? Well, in in my opinion, the court um, largely overlooked the Establishment Clause problems. Um, And so they did find that this was just a public safety program, so that they equated it to something like the fire department responding to a fire at a church or a police department responding to some type of criminal activity happening at the church. Um, and so, and they said it's the same thing, um, and there's nothing particularly religious about a playground. Um, I, I would I would add a fact to, to Maggie's summary is that this was not an independent religious school. This was a, a ministry of a church. So it was a church that had a preschool um, and 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 it was that that church ministry that that had applied for this grant, um, and so BJC filed a brief, um, and we really looked at the history of these provisions, 
and um, and we looked at why it's important to have the separation. And we didn't want to get into the question of when can a government come on, come onto a church property and say, this is secular, so we get to fund it, we get to regulate it. This is religious, so we don't. And, and walk through your church property like that. We want churches to be able to have their independent independence and autonomy and be able to make those decisions and use their property how they see best fit to carry out their religious mission. Um, and, and so we think that Trinity Lutheran muddied that water by saying that uh, not only could the church apply for it, but that the, the state needed um, to, to pay them the money contrary to, to their own state constitutional provision, uh, w- which had been enacted um, in, in, in multiple parts of, uh, of its constitution. I think they had four different provisions that, that talked about not aiding, not using taxpayer money to, to aid religious in- institutions. Yeah. And I, um, these are like the really hard questions, um, and not punting, but, um, you know, as a church state separationist, um, I feel like, you know, we've kind of, the courts have kind of created this problem for us at this point. So there used to be much more strict lines and therefore you didn't have to ask these questions of is a playground religious or are they going to have religious ceremonies on the playground or do they read religious books on the program? It was much, much clearer to prevent us from having to get into those questions. And then as the, the courts, um, you know, not to blame the courts entirely. I mean, Congress and, and, and states have been pushing the court to, to move this way. But as the court has been so slowly chipping away at the, the, the wall of separation, um, it is creating more and more problems. And it's kind of interesting because we kind of get to the problem of like, well, we're, we can't really say what, if it's religious or not. And so we have to allow it. And so it's almost by creating the problems that's inching them along to um, to further erode the separation of church and state. Sort of like we created this problem and now we're in a big mess. So maybe that's a good opportunity to, to bring up another case, which was decided in the last few years, the Hobby Lobby case, which held that closely held for-profit corporations could use RIFRA to deny healthcare benefits to their employers, even though the benefits were required by law. And part of the holding was that the, the court said that the government did not make a compelling enough case why closely held for-profit corporations should be treated differently from religious nonprofits. So could you talk a little bit more about that case and its implications for what a religious organization is? Uh, sure. So the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, um, is a federal statute that um, is supposed to protect religious freedom. The idea is that um, if, you're, if your religion is burdened, uh, you can go to the government and say that this government law um, or activity is burdening your religion and the government has to have a compelling interest um, and it has to be um, the least restrictive means for them to um, to. to to push the law on you. I know that's a lot of, of legalese. Um, but the question in that case was, does RIFRA apply to corporations? Um, and many of us said, uh, no, it doesn't apply to corporations. Like what religion does a corporation have? Um, it doesn't, no one envisioned, um, that corporations like a corporation like Hobby Lobby, um, that has, you know, craft stores around the country could get out of, um, having to adhere to the law because they're a religious organization. So the court really based that opinion in, um, the statute itself. It said, let's look at how they define person. So they, you know, did a bunch of legal stuff and said, um, person includes corporations and there's no reason why we should distinguish, you know, this corporation. There's no reason why religious corporations are different than, um, um, secular corporate. It applies to all corporations. They all get to use it if they say they have a, a religious objection. Um, and the danger there, I mean, I think that was dangerous to begin with, but, but now that is really seeping out into other areas of the law. So, um, even if they were right, which I think they weren't, that RIFRA applied to Hobby Lobby, um, now the question is, what do you, what happens in other federal statutes? So, um, for example, there's a, a federal statute that says that corporations can't, um, discriminate in hiring. Um, and so then the question becomes, and there's a religious exemption for that. So religious corporations can't discriminate in hiring. And the Trump administration has been leaning towards now an interpretation that for-profit corporations, even there, um, could, uh, could discriminate because they're religious. So it is this, this complicated question again of, um, can, can, 
where do you draw these lines? Um, is Hobby Lobby, who just happens to say, you know, our owners are religious, do they get religious exemptions everywhere now? Um, can you be, I, I remember back when the contraception, um, uh, regulations were being passed on the Obama administration. Someone said, well, I think, you know, Taco Bell should be able to get, um, an exemption from providing contraception. And, um, does it mean, does it mean that McDonald's and, and Taco Bell and all these corporations, does it mean if you, you're a French, you own a franchise of Taco Bell and you are religious, um, that you get to say, well, my Taco Bell is religious and I get out of, you know, whatever I want because I get a religious exemption. I would say that far, um, exceeds the line, but there are arguments today that that should be true. Yes, yeah, so I, I would agree that there are certainly groups that are looking to expand Hobby Lobby beyond, uh, well beyond what, what the court ruled. Um, the court ruled for Hobby Lobby in that case because they found a win-win situation. They found the government had created this other program and couldn't explain why for-profit corporations couldn't participate in that program. Um, and so there was a way for the female employees and f- female relatives of male employees to get the co- contraception uh, without it um, c- coming from um, the Green family in this case. Um, I don't think that that means the default position is employers always win in these cases, but we certainly have people making that argument and, 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 and trying to espouse that as, as the true interpretation of Hobby Lobby, which we would both vehemently disagree with. So I think you bring up so many interesting and important questions about what constitutes a corporation that's able to claim an exemption who gets to claim an exemption, whether it's only limited to religion? So, for example, could you tell some of our audience might not be familiar with U.S. case law and sort of how we treat these issues? Could a someone who identifies as a humanist or an atheist with sincerely held convictions that are as totalizing as what we often think of as a religious worldview go before the court and claim an exemption from a neutrally applicable law and say that it's grounded in a sincerely held belief, even if it's not linked with a traditional religion. So I know that that's been allowed, for example, in certain conscientious objection cases Mm -hmm. for military service. Does it extend beyond that? Or could you talk about the the conscientious objection cases that it does apply to? Well, in the conscientious objector cases, uh, the court looked at, they again went to the text of the statute, and they found that um, between the various iterations that Congress had passed and had been enacted into law, Congress broadened the the, the um, definition of who would be covered by religion. And so so the court f- followed suit and, and ensured that, that that protection was as broad as, um, the, as the language in the statute. Um, and so these cases really depend on how how we define words in, in statutes and, and how we use them in context and how we reference other statutes. So if Congress wants to pass a law with a very expansive definition um, of, of a religious uh, person or, or organization, there are many examples of that th- throughout the law that, 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 that th- the courts have interpreted. Um, the question is whether they could write something more narrow that would exclude some groups. And that would be more difficult to do, especially given the other statutes that, that seem to be on this path of, uh, towards increasing the number of people who, who, who can, um, claim the ability to, to live out their, um, beliefs, uh, that, that, that might be all encompassing and, and, and similar to, to a, a religious belief or practice. Yeah. In the conscientious objector cases, um, there were, s- the idea was, um, that it would apply to people who maybe didn't say that they were religious, but had a a a belief that was held as strongly and similarly to um, to a religious belief. And some of the statutory things, I don't you know, I don't know that there's ever been a claim under RIFRA where someone has um, tried to to make that claim. Um, I do think it's interesting though that under RIFRA and under some of the other laws, uh, you can't really, and I think this is right, you can't really. Um, question whether or not it's a real religious belief, right? So you can't say, again, I, I usually use Lutheran because it's it's me and so I'm not offending anyone, but you can't say, um, Maggie, what's your religious belief? I'm now going to look and see whether your pastor says that your belief and like, sort of go up the chain of the Lutheran church and the Lutheran doctrine and see if it all matches up. Um, I could say I'm Lutheran and I could also say that my my views completely are different than the than the traditional Lutheran church 
beliefs, um, which is the way that it should be. The, the danger, of course, though, is um, that now everyone who has any religious belief can come and say, I'm going to challenge the law um, because as applied to me, um, it, you know, it's a substantial burden on my religion. Um, and I don't often say that I agree with Justice Scalia, but, um, you know, Justice Scalia many years ago decided the Smith case, Employment Division versus Smith, and, um, and he was talking about, uh, religious exemptions and, and, um, the, the free exercise clause and, uh, you know, whether or not this test that is now RIFRA is the right test. And he spoke about how there'd be anarchy because every person would be a law amongst themselves, um, because they could sort of say, you know, whatever conflicts with my religion, now I want to get a religious exemption. Um, and of course, you know, it's not like um, RIFRA isn't a trump card. There is sort of the other side balancing of is there a compelling interest and um, is it narrowly tailored? But that is getting um, harder for the government to meet. And so, um, so yeah, it sort of creates, again, this um, quandary of if we are saying that every person's religious belief should be recognized under RIFRA, if it's, you know, if they say it's a, if they say, A, it's a burden and it's a substantial burden, the, the court now um, sort of agrees with them. Um, what does this mean? Does it mean that we are getting ourselves into this? I mean, we're not quite there. I don't mean to be too alarmist, but we're moving down the line that uh, Scalia is talking about. Well, and one of the things I always like to point out when I teach uh, RIFRA to college groups um, who come to visit BJC is RIFRA, if you look at the statutory language, it protects against a substantial burden on an exercise of religion. And I think sometimes exercise of religion has gotten lost um, and people try to substitute religious belief with that. There's a big difference between exercise and belief. Um, and, and Congress, when, when, when the law was enacted, they chose the word exercise. And so that has to have some kind of meaning. Um, and so I, I look forward to the day when the, the courts are looking at all parts of RIFRA. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the religious objector needs to win. And then sometimes the religious um, burden just cannot be accommodated. Um, but it should be a situation where we, we all have the ability um, to be able to come into court and, and be able to make our claim. Um, but we have to look at all parts of the test. Otherwise, the, the test is not, it is not working in the balanced way that it was intended. Right. And I think that that actually brings up a court, uh, a case that is not currently before the court, although cert has been uh, filed. So this is the Ricks versus Idaho Board of Contractors case in which uh, someone says that for reasons of sincerely held religious belief, he does not want to have to uh, offer a social security number to the state in order to have a contract. So here we have someone who um, it's not a commonly held religious belief, but it's sincerely held by this particular person. So what are, as we try to balance uh truly recognizing that a religious belief might be sincerely held, even if it's not commonly held, and recognizing that the state has some compelling interest sometimes in asking people to do things that they don't want to do for reasons of sincerely held religious belief. How do we balance those two things? You mentioned the difference between belief and exercise. You know, I know when I'm in spaces with a lot of, especially conservative religious folks and progressive, they say that a belief without the option to exercise that belief is not really a, a strong protection. That if you can't act on the things that you feel most strongly about, then that is certainly a, a substantial burden in, in some way. So if you're a judge sitting before uh, some of these decisions, trying to decide whether to force people to do what it is that they want to do, um, and saying that at the same time, you're someone who believes in religious freedom. How do you reconcile those two things in your head or for the public? When is, uh, do we just recognize that sometimes we abridge religious freedom or, or that certain things we don't necessarily consider as religious as others? So for example, if someone um, says that they, something that we think of as a core, quote unquote core practice, something that you do in a church or a mosque or a synagogue. Um, it, I think it would be very difficult for a court to say that that wasn't allowed, right? That the, it, right. Would, it would take a lot for them to say, we are going to stop you from doing that activity. But as things leave the four walls of a house of worship, we often think that 
whatever activity is being conducted is not as religious as, as the activity in the church. So could you just walk us through sort of from a religious studies angle, how do we think about religion and the law and where, where it becomes less and less important for the government to safeguard that particular act? I, so one of the things you were asking in that is if, if you were a judge, sort of where would you start? Um, I would start with um, the, one of the, the, the questions that should be asked in the Establishment Clause, which is, um, are we giving a religious accommodation that is harming others? And I think this is sort of like a basic civics class thing that we learn as kids, which is, you know, your rights end where my rights begin. Um, and so at Americans United, we always say, is this going to cause harm to other people? Um, and so I think that right off the gate, or out of the gate, is one of the first questions you ask. So um, in the case about the Social Security number, is it causing harm to other people? Um I don't know that case that well, but like maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, in cases where, um, it's an issue of, can I get out of a non-discrimination law? So can I, you know, there's a, I live in a state that says I cannot discriminate against LGBTQ employees. Um, I say that that violates my religious beliefs. Um, the question should be, if, if I give you that accommodation, what happens to someone else? And the answer is they're discriminated against. And that is not, that, that's, to me, that is the, the end of the question, right? Like there's a dignity harm, there is a loss of a job, there is a loss of a promotion, um, and therefore you don't get your religious exemption because you're causing, you know, serious impacts on other people. Um, that's where I start. Yeah, and my answer would be very similar, um, but I would also look, I would look at um, the, the harm to others outside of the religious community. So we all, as a Baptist, I go to my church, and there are certain expectations on me as a member that visitors, if Maggie were to come visit my church with me on Sunday, would not have those same expectations put upon her. Um, and so if the, uh, if the exemption is primarily going to affect people who have voluntarily chosen to be part of that religious community, then I think there should be a thumb on the scale towards granting that exemption. But if the exemption is largely going to impact those outside of the religious community, the, the, those who have not voluntarily um, um, uh, come to this belief or practice, then then the government should look seriously at how do we minimize this harm outside of the religious community. And if it cannot be minimized, then maybe it cannot be granted. But but we have a long history of religious exemptions. And so I, th I think that's something we always have to keep in mind. There are even people who say that our first exemption is in the Constitution itself when the president is allowed to swear or affirm an oath of office. Because um, in our colonial days, our Quaker brothers and sisters could not could not swear an oath, and so in order to um, permit them to to be able to run for the highest office in the land, an exemption was made so that the the oath could be affirmed in, instead of sworn, and that obviously impacts no one. It, it it has no negative harm to someone else, so that's an easy one to grant. The the much more difficult cases are when the primary impacts of, of that um, exemption would be on someone outside of the religious community. Can I ask an, another line I think for me becomes a, a clear line is when the religious organization gets money. And that's kind of takes us in a way back to Espinoza um, where they are asking for government funds. Um, to me, if you, once, so the idea of religious exemptions for religious organizations and sort of, you know, the government staying out is for them to have autonomy, for them to make their own rules. Um, you know, they, they're sort of, again, they're kept separate. Um, but once you take government funds voluntarily uh, to perform a program, to get some sort of a benefit, to me, the government now, you, you've sort of lost your I want to remain autonomous argument. Um, and now the government, I think, has the right to go in and say you have to go by government rules. So um, if you take uh, a, a voucher, a private school voucher in Montana um, or any other place, then you should have to adhere to the same rules as everyone else. You should not still get the religious exemption that you're getting. You're getting the religious exemption because you are religious and you want to maintain your autonomy. Um, but if you get government funds, um, you've already sort of given up your autonomy and you don't get to get special exemptions at the same time that you get government money. Um, this has been an issue um, since George W. Bush's years about employment discrimination, uh, where they put in place rules that say you can get government contracts and government grants. Um, so you're taking money from the government to perform a social service, and um, then you are still allowed to have your own religious hiring litmus test. Uh, to me, that is wrong. Um, it is one thing for um, the Lutheran Church to be able to say we hire Lutherans um, for certain positions. Obviously, we hire a Lutheran pastor to be our pastor. It is another 
another thing to say, um, we want to get a government contract to provide services uh, for the public and that we still get to place our religious litmus test. To me, that's, that's a line. I think that's a really helpful set of distinctions of how people can think about these issues. I'm curious, could you give us just some easy examples where you maybe both agree this is an obvious case where an exemption should be granted? I think it's helpful. Often we spend a lot of time talking about how the the limits of exemptions and where they start perhaps offer, uh, creating dignitary harm or leading to improper use of government funds. What are some obvious exemption, a, a, examples of exemptions and why are they not leading to this kind of slippery slope of, of everyone has their own law that applies to them? I'm going to go first because I probably have, um, you're probably broader in your exemptions than I am. <laughs> so um, we filed a brief on behalf of, of a, a, a Muslim man who was um, incarcerated. He wanted to wear a beard in accordance with his religious faith. It was a, a short beard and the prison system said, uh, no, he can't for two reasons. Um uh, one, we have a compelling interest because one, um, he could have his photo taken without the beard and then have his photo taken with his half, it's like a quarter inch beard or something. We'll never know who he is. Um, and the, the court was like, yeah, that's not really that compelling. And then another one was he could hide weapons in there, which, um, probably not, uh, many weapons are being hidden in this quarter inch beard. Um, but we argued that yes, it's a, you know, he has a, a, a sincere religious belief, uh, the government's compelling interest is really not believable. He is not hurting anybody. Um, so that is something where we came down on his side. We would come down on um, the side of a student in a school where there's a no hat rule and they want to wear a yarmulke. Um, that is not hurting anybody. Um, clearly should be provided. Um, uh, some some uh, cases where you want a day off to provide to celebrate your the religious Sabbath, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the ones that are very clear for us. Yeah, no, another big case, which, which was around the time of uh, of the case of the prisoner, was about an applicant at um, Abercrombie and Fitch stores, and she wanted to wear her um, hijab as a part of her uh, religious practice, and um, Abercrombie didn't want to hire her on, on that basis, and so that that was a case that unified the religious liberty community. Um, every religious or religious liberty group that filed a brief in that case filed on her side and said no, like an applicant should be able to wear the religious garb um, that does not interfere with any safety concerns, um, you know, that, that might have been present in, in, in that employment role. Um, and so there's a number of cases that, that unify us. Of course, the ones that get the most attention are the, the ones that divide us. Right. So with the time that we have left, going back to Espinoza, um, where do we stand? I have two, two questions. One is to wrap up on Espinoza and think about um, where this conversation leaves us with the tax credit and whether it, it's uh, it, different things that we've talked about, whether it's funding or dignitary harm or uh, leading to an excessive entanglement between a religious institution and a secular institution. So trying to bring together some of the different uh, tests or legal ideas that we've talked about and how it applies to this case. And then my second question, which is somewhat related, is as lawyers, as people in litigation, the litigation arena, thinking about our audience, what are ways that religious studies scholars can communicate their research and findings to the legal field so that they can better inform how we think about religious liberty cases, what constitutes a religion or what is religion, what is religious freedom, and how we think about the separation of church and state. You can tackle one or both or neither of those. Yeah. I, I'm going to start with your second question about um, how religious scholars could be helpful in cases like this. I um, I feel like I sound so skeptical today, but um, I sort of looking at free exercise cases and establishment clause cases, 
Oftentimes, I think that if you are a, a of a minority faith and it is something that is not well known to the justices or not well known um, to the public, you will lose your case, right? Because you know, if it's about communion wine, like it's pretty, you know, people like understand what what that means, or it's about kosher food, people sort of understand in this culture what that means, and the justices would understand that. But if it's a Native American religion, or if it um, is, uh, you know, something about observing being uh, observing as a Muslim, like sometimes those things sound, you know, different. And when they sound different, they don't. It doesn't click sometimes that that could be a substantial burden on your religion. Um, and so I think some religious education about um, some of the meaning that that these practices have to other uh, religions could be helpful um, pretty much to everybody. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that point. And um, I, I love reading our, our Baptist historians, and we we have used them in our briefs on, on a, a number of occasion, occasions. So any ability to, you know, continue the scholarly work and research, um, but figure out ways that are more contextual and, and, and that we could, we could cite or that, you know, that we could use, um, in, in telling a story, uh, would certainly be helpful. Um, back to the wrapping up of Espinoza. Um, I, I do think as religious organizations, um, are asking for more and more, um, to be treated like everyone else that we need to be careful what we ask for. Uh, we are given a lot of exemptions um, and treated um, differently in a lot of ways that benefit us. And and those um, th- those exemptions and special treatments become harder to defend if, if we're funded just like everyone else. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I would certainly want to remind um, religious listeners, whether they be scholars or just people who attend church, um, that whenever the institutions of government and religion have mixed, history has shown us that religion has always lost. Um, so if we want to maintain our, our, our uniqueness and, and, and our special legal char- characteristics, then we're going to have to uh, fight to um, maintain our, our separateness, which is why separation of church and state has always been a, a, a move led by uh, religious groups here in the U S you know, for, from, from our, our colonial days till now, um, it's not a secular versus a religious fight. It, it's a religious versus religious fight. Great. Well, I think that's a great place to leave things. Um, I want to thank you both so much for coming on. I think it's been a really fascinating and uh, generative discussion. I hope our scholars and other uh, audience members who are listening, whether you are in academia, outside academia in a religious community, not in a religious community, that this has helped open up, some of our thinking about what it means to protect religious freedom, to think about the separation of church and state, and the complicated questions that it brings up when we say that we support or don't support religious freedom. So uh, thank you both so much for being here today, and uh, I look forward to having discussions with you in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you so much for that really exciting discussion on the separation of religion and state. And this is something actually that has a lot of relevance in Australia at the moment because we are, well, we, not we, the government is trying to pass a religious discrimination bill. And in fact, in this bill, they do not define religion in any sort of way, shape or form. And there is a lot of concern that Indigenous faith and Indigenous spirituality will be completely left out and completely overlooked. Um, But also it's highly controversial because there is some sort of sense that the bill will allow um, discrimination based on religious belief, even though it's it's sort of posing as an anti-discrimination bill. You know, in the first instance, the first draft of this bill there was a clause that meant that a doctor could actually refuse treatment based on their faith, um, which is highly problematic. But in terms of um, um, the US, Dave, is this sort of something that is a a federal thing or a state-by-state thing, this idea of religious discrimination? There's a lot of different ways that I do it. It, In in what we heard today, they, they focused a little bit more on America's kind of really unique 
separation of church and state. So one of the real problems that we have in in the U.S. judicial system is trying to understand who has the authority to talk and to write laws about religion and how far can those laws go and, and what can they ask people to do. I think it's common to both Australia and U.S. that often laws get named religious discrimination or the classic example in the U.S. is the right to work. Right to work laws actually are about being employed at will and being able to be fired by your employer for any reason. And it's a right to work because you have the right to leave your job at any moment if you so choose. So I think what I'm hearing from you is that there's a similar kind of issue with how religious discrimination is is being framed here, where uh, the question is, could this law actually reinforce and and reinstantiate religious discrimination based on the arbitrary kind of categories of belief uh, and religion that the court assumes? And that's definitely a problem in the U.S. as well. Yeah, I think that what's coming across from sort of advisory bodies that are discussing this bill is that it's actually really problematic to sort of, you know, favour one particular worldview in terms of what is, what is you know, considered to be harassment or what is considered to be discrimination. And particularly the bill and the, the perspective that it is coming from, in my opinion, is one that champions anti-discrimination in regards to Christian belief and so mm. how that sort of relates to beliefs of other traditions and unspiritualities and even political beliefs. There's sort of been this discussion about how do political beliefs fit in in terms of our sort of recent passing of, of same-sex marriage, for example, right. and religious beliefs are being sort of listed as prime as in over and above political beliefs and this sort of these sort of boundaries as to what what is and isn't, you know, kosher for lack of a better term, is is causing a lot of discussion around this particular bill. And to be honest, I don't I don't actually see it sort of resolving any any time soon. Yeah, I think in in the US right now we're particularly concerned given the slate of uh cases that today's podcast talked about that the change in the kind of political alignment of the court, that is how many of the nine justices are conservative leaning versus liberal leading has changed. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that that reconfiguration has meant that they're thinking in really different ways about what the role of government is regarding religious laws and, and favoring, the ability of the people to act and behave and believe in in ways unencumbered by the law actually ends up diminishing protections for those that are not in what the court is presenting as the kind of normative view. So if you are not in that kind of normative category, just like in Australia, if you are potentially an indigenous person and your beliefs don't fit in that category, it makes you more vulnerable uh, from the law's perspective because you don't fit the model that is there. This is such, you know, it's a discussion that we really could just keep having. And we need to, you know, make a very serious plug for the response that will come out for this podcast on Friday. Every Friday we have a response, sometimes more than one, um, for our fabulous podcast. So keep an eye out for that coming up. Absolutely. We, and we, um, we really want to uh, encourage everybody that listens to the podcast to go to the website uh, and check on Fridays if you're not a member of our mailing list to to join that because we really do try to create a conversation um, among scholars, not only in the podcast episodes themselves, but also in the responses. And we have them uh, every week come out. Sometimes they don't come out the week that the podcast has come. There may be a week or two later, but we are always having them and we're hoping to do some changes in the future that make those even more accessible. Um, Next week, we have some interesting stuff. What's on the docket next week, Brie? You're on the docket next week. Yes. Hooray. And you have a fabulous interview coming up with Bradley Onishi on the sacrality of the secular and philosophy of religion, which I know I'm very much looking forward to. Um, but until then, the only thing left to say is thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening.
The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation charity number, SC047750. Brought to you by editors Brianne Fallon and David McConaughey, and founding editors Chris Cotter, that's me, and David Robertson, that's him. Our features are edited by Rebecca Barrett-Fox with marketing managed by Benjamin Marcus. Our Opportunities Digest managed by Ella Buck, podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, and social media managed by Ray Radford. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com backslash project rs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. Thanks for listening.